رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد Tonight, insha'Allah ta'ala, we are continuing our journey, our masira, through the summary of Zad al-Ma'at, authored by the esteemed and late scholar of Islam, Shamsuddin ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya, rahimahullah ta'ala. We began discussing last week the issue of Salat al-Jumu'ah and the day of Jumu'ah more specifically. So we entered into the chapter which deals with the virtues of the day of Jumu'ah, Friday. We spoke about some of the narrations that Ibn al-Qayyim introduced to us. And this day is a very important day in the week not just in the year, as we will get to, inshallah, but every week. This is a type of uh, celebration that is a weekly affair. Before we get into that, I'd like to mention something, and it's good for us every week, you know, as a prelude to what we're going to speak about to discuss a particular issue or topic or to pre- mention an anecdote of times past, etc. That we want to discuss the difference between that which is wise and that which is permissible. Right? That which is Halal or Jaiz, Wama Hua Min Al Hikmah. And it's been said by the scholars of Fiqh, Rahimahumullah, that Laysa Al Fiqhu An Ta'lama Al Harama Min Al Halal, Bal Al Hikmah or Al Fiqh Hakkan, An Tumayyiza Baina. الخير وما هو خير منه وأن تميز بين الشر وما هو شر منه وأن تندل وتعرف أخف الضررين وأحسن وأخير الخيرين It's been said that true understanding, true wisdom an understanding of the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, just, is not to merely know what is right from what is wrong. What is right from what is wrong is pretty clear cut. But true fiqh in the, on the stage of life is that an individual who has been given wisdom by Allah is able to differentiate between what is good and what is better and to be able to differentiate between what is bad and what is worse. This is true fiqh. And there is an issue which is that which is halal, that which is permissible, that which there is no sin involved in directly, doesn't necessarily mean that it is a wise thing to do. What does that mean? A lot of people can't make that distinction. What does it mean when you say that not everything that is permissible is necessarily wise? It could even be said that not everything that is preferable, preferred in every circumstance and every time and place, and is not necessarily as appropriate 
for every time and place. And a very similar example for this is something along the lines of law and common sense, right? So for example, we have certain laws. If you're walking down the sidewalk and there is some people on the sidewalk or there's people walking by or whatever it is, and these individuals are in public and you are videotaping them, for instance, or take pictures of them, this may be this may be lawful. You may have not broken the law by doing this. Let's say a, a police officer is, is uh, standing on the uh, sidewalk and you run up and you shove a, a video camera in his face or whatever it is. You may not have committed a crime per se, but is that behavior necessarily productive? Is it something which is of wisdom, right? Likewise, for instance, the bare minimum for a man to wear in making salah or in public is the knee to the, to the navel. And to make salah, the, the shoulders have to be covered with something. This is the bare minimum. This is the bare minimum of what a man must wear when he's in public or especially if he's going to pray. But is it necessarily wise for a person to go to the masjid or go out in public dressed like this with just a pair of long pants or shorts from his navel to his uh, knees and then just go outside and walk around. This is permissible. The person hasn't committed any crime. They have not done anything haram. They have not done anything sinful per se. But is that necessarily appropriate? The answer is no, that's not appropriate. Or let's say you know, instead of uh, me wearing a regular thobe and a regular hat, I wear hats with feathers coming out of it, right? And I wear a thobe that is like leopard print thobe. It's halal. I haven't uh, imitated any disbelievers. I haven't imitated animals. I haven't worn anything that is... Uh, particular to other religions, so it may be permissible in itself, and then I go to the masjid to lead salah like that. But is that appropriate? No, that is not appropriate, right? Certain behavior is permissible, but it may not be appropriate, right? It may not be wise, such as, for example, a person who is, uh, a person who is, has a serious position and they're walking around and, you know, acting foolish and acting immature, etc. There are many examples. The point is, is that not necessarily everything that is permissible is something that should be done or is something that is appropriate. And we will give examples of this from the Quran and from the Sunnah. But the most important thing that we need to understand is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum. We need to understand the statement of Allah, which is in Surah Yaseen, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we document that which they do and the, their actions in one of the meanings of this verse. And so, who is not exist in a vacuum. It's going to have effects and ripples and ripple out 
to the world around you. And those effects may be positive or negative. If they are positive, then you will be rewarded for this. And if they are negative, then you will be held to account for this. This is why we hold people to account for negligence. This is why we hold people to account, etc. Because these actions or lack of actions do have effects. If a person is negligent and, you know, is a zookeeper and is negligent with the locks on the lion's cage, they didn't open the cage for the lion to get out and eat the uh, visitors or attack the visitors. The zookeeper didn't intend, didn't even want this to happen. But the negligence of not keeping this animal uh, locked up properly, the effects of that negligence is something that that person will be held to account for. Likewise, everything that we do, right? Everything that we do. <clears throat> The things that we do, they may themselves be something permissible, but the effects that they will have may be negative. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, then he is to speak with that which is good or remain silent. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَكُلِّ عِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنٍ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ He said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and tell my servants to say that which is best, that which is superior. Right? So what does this mean? He didn't say, uh, صلى الله عليه وسلم, whoever in the last day, then let him speak with that which is permissible, or speak with that which is truthful, though all of these things are prerequisites of something being good, but it is a level higher than that, and that is that it has to be good or remain silent. Al-Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah, he said, commenting on this narration, this narration is an evidence that when a person goes to say something, they should first think about what it is they are about to say. If they are positive that what they are about to say is good and will have positive effects, then they may speak. If they are sure that what they are going to say is bad or will have a bad effect, then they are to remain silent. And if they are then they are to remain silent. We have only been given permission to speak with that which we are certain is good, good in itself, and will have good effects. And so, <clears throat> if we understand this concept, we will come to understand that only one, for something to be permissible in Islam, that is one part of the equation. It also has to be appropriate. And a person could say that not everything that is appropriate, not everything that is permissible is appropriate for every time and place. When we go to speak about certain issues, certain issues, maybe historical events that happened amongst the companions or issues that, uh, you know, the, the people that are unlearned or not well uh, versed in the meanings of the Quran and Sunnah, should we go and unveil these issues to them in public? No, of course not. Just like we wouldn't feed our newborn uh, a piece of steak, right? Because a newborn it's good, it tastes good, it's fine, it's healthy, it's halal, it's all of that, but it's not appropriate for a child of that age. This is something that we in large understand, but a lot of times people like to play games with words because they want to do something or don't want to do it. And so, 
It's very important for us to understand that not everything that is truthful or everything that is necessarily permissible is necessarily appropriate for every time and place. I think this is something that most of us understand. It is pretty common sense. The Prophet وسلم, said to Aisha, and now if we look at the Kaaba, the way that it's built, it's, a, it's almost exactly a cube, but actually it was not supposed to be that shape. The original Kaaba, which Ibrahim and Ismail والسلام, built, was actually mustatil. It was rectangular in shape, so it was like a rectangle, and then it was uh, built up. It wasn't exactly a cube. And so, Quraysh, when they built this Kaaba on the original foundations of Ibrahim, they did not have enough halal money. Halal money, or money that is pure, because they, their condition was, we will only put funds into the building or the rebuilding of the Kaaba that is uh, definitely pure. So no uh, money earned through riba, no money earned through prostitution, no money that has been swindled or stolen or the property of another will be used toward rebuilding the Kaaba. Well, they didn't have enough of this pure money to rebuild the Kaaba exactly as Ibrahim had rebuilt it. So they built it as it is today, and then they placed markings, which is what is referred to as Hijr Ismail, which is that kind of um, crescent-shaped uh, area there in front of the Kaaba. This was to mark the original foundations of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is why we don't make tawaf only around the Kaaba. We make tawaf around the Kaaba and Hijr Ismail, because that's the original foundation. Well, when the Prophet وسلم, returned to Mecca in the conquest of Mecca, when he uh, returned, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the Kaaba was now under his control, and Mecca was now as well under the control of the Muslims, people of Mecca had accepted Islam, etc. He said to Aisha radiallahu anha, he said, had it not been that your people, referring to Quraysh, had it not been that Quraysh are new to Islam and have just left a time of ignorance, I would have demolished the Kaaba and rebuilt it upon the original foundations of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And I would have put two doors into it, a door for people to enter and a door from which people to exit. Right? So he didn't do that. Why not? Why didn't he do it? This was obviously permissible. It was halal, actually, it was encouraged to rebuild it as the way that Ibrahim alayhi salam had originally constructed it. However, the effects of this on Quraysh would be negative, and this, these ill effects, this negativity, would outweigh any benefit to be ha had or achieved by These people had just accepted Islam. And the Kaaba, they grew up, they all came together, they all collectively believed that the Kaaba was the most holiest of sites and the most holiest of places and buildings in the world. Not even uh, 50 some years or actually about 60 years earlier, the elders amongst them still remembered watching when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed Abraha and his army that came to demolish the Kaaba. There were still people amongst them who remembered this. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely defended the Kaaba. And so the, the position and the status that the Kaaba held in the hearts of these people was, uh, was something that was well, deeply rooted. And so they've been at war with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for all of these uh, all of these years, and then suddenly, as soon as they accept Islam, and the Prophet السلام, comes and conquers Mecca, the first thing he does is destroy the Kaaba. This will cause mass confusion. It will cause people to misunderstand. They have not learned exalting the Prophet they have not learned the true position of the Kaaba in Islam, etc., etc. So whilst this is something lawful, was lawful for him, something that he wished he could do, he ultimately did not do that. Why? Because this would be something that would have negative effects. This is something that we need to understand. This doesn't happen in obligation and prohibition. Uh, though it can, but this is something that occurs in differentiating between that which is good and that which is better, that which is permissible and that which is appropriate, right? And so, if we understand this, we will start to uh, use common sense and understand how to uh, employ the principles and the obligate and the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our lives. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he said, Haddithu nasa bima ya'qilun atuhibbuna an yukadhab Allahu wa rasooluhu. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, the great Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said, when you address the people, address them with that which they understand. Don't go above their heads. Don't speak to them of something that is too foreign for them to understand at that time. He said, would you desire, meaning lest Allah and his messenger be belied. Right? Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, مَا أَنْتَ مُحَدِّثًا قَوْمًا حَدِيثًا لَا تَبْلُغُهُ عُقُولُهُمْ إِلَّا كَانَ لِبَعْضِهِمْ فِتْنَةً Anytime you speak to people with something they cannot understand, they're not ready to understand yet, then it will always, this statement of yours or this information will always act as, as a source of fitna for some of these people that can't understand it. And so, we make sure that we, uh, we make sure that we teach people properly, that we behave properly with that which is appropriate. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنٌ Tell my servants to, do, to say and do that which is best. Not only that which is good or that which is permissible or that which is acceptable, but they must do that which is best. We choose that which is best in any situation. So, for example, if I have guests come over to my house, honoring my guest and entertaining my guest is something that I am obligated to do. But as well during this time, let's say I pray during that time. I pray, we're not talking about obligatory prayer, we're speaking about additional optional prayer. Is it better for me to spend the time praying, or is it better for me to tend to my guests? Obviously, 
It is the second, the latter. Is it permissible to pray? Yes, sure. Am I harming anyone? Of course not. Is it appropriate in that time and place for me to choose that? No, it is, that is inappropriate, right? So this is a, an issue that we need to take into consideration. And we need to uh, keep it in the forefront of our minds whenever we do something, especially when it comes to interaction with people. Especially when it comes to interaction with people. <clears throat> Before we continue on the issue of Salat al Jumu'ah, I also would like to mention something that came up during the week. And these are just uh, issues that, we, that may arise and um, I may find that they are beneficial or of consequence to the listener because these are common issues. One of the issues that came up and was asked uh, throughout last week was a question came up on whether or not it is permissible to use a means of making a decision such as flipping a coin, right? Flipping a coin. So for example, should I go to this restaurant or that restaurant? Or should I go right or should I go left or should I buy this thing or not buy it so I'm going to flip a coin is this something which is permissible the answer is this is not permissible and this is a type of azlam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that al azlam which we'll discuss inshallah this is something which is, as Allah describes, a filth from the handiwork of a shaitan. So stay clear of it and avoid it completely in order that you all may attain success. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran regarding al-Azlam. Al-Azlam is different than casting lots. Al-Fuqaha, wallahu azza wa jal. في القرآن فرق بين الأزلام والاستهام أو المساهمة. There is a difference between الأزلام and ال الاستهام. What is the difference? That that is that what is more more known is the difference between al-qur'a wal azlam so what is let's begin with what al azlam are al azlam is a type of deciding method that the people of jahiliya the pagans of jahiliya used to use in order to make decisions Usually it was arrows, or it can have other ways. We don't care about the exact way that it was done. We care about the spirit of it, right? In the time of the Prophet wasallam, the way that the Islam would work is they would have three, piece, three sticks or three arrows or three things, right? Could even be rocks or anything that have... One, one of these arrows has written on it, uh, do it, or do it as it is Allah's will, or something <clears throat> along those lines. And then one, another would have, do not do it, and the, other, and the third would be blank, right? Blank, or it would have, you know, something like try again, or ask again, or... Now, what about if, it, if we have something that has four or five, the magic eight ball? All of this is the same. I don't know if those are around anymore. When I was a kid, something called the magic eight ball, which is a big, looks like a pool eight ball, right? But it has a little window on it. 
And this window has, I don't know, there's some kind of liquid inside of it and there's things written on this object that's inside, right? And so the idea was the magic eight ball, you ask a question, you know, should I do this? And then you shake it and you look into the window and it will float to the top and give you, yes, do it or don't do it or probably not or preferably not to or whatever, right? I don't remember exactly what was said on there. There was a number, maybe eight or ten different answers that this magic eight ball would have or would present you, okay? Just because in the time of the Prophet wasallam, it was three doesn't mean if it's four, it's permissible, or if it's two, it's permissible. This is all superstition. This is all impermissible. So, continuing on, when a person at that time would wish to do something, should I marry this woman, or should I go traveling, or should I marry this man, or should I, whatever it is, right? They would draw one of these arrows, or one of these rocks, or one of these pieces, and they would look at it, and whatever it said, they believed that that was guided and inspired by God, right? We have uh, many examples of this. I mentioned one, the magic eight ball. Another is the tarot cards, right? People who use tarot cards. This is all a type of tatayur, and this is all a type of, a type of uh, shirk, minor shirk in Islam. Flipping the coin is part of al-Islam. This is different than drawing lots. Drawing lots is mentioned in the Qur'an twice, and it's also mentioned in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is drawing lots? Al-Qur'a or al-Istiham. Al-Istiham is when we have holes, right, that all have an equal right to something, and there is no determining factor except drawing, as we say in America or in English, drawing straws, right? Drawing, casting lots. This is, this is, uh, in this case, permissible. This is how we make these decisions. So, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions drawing lots twice. He mentions it in the story of Zakariya and Maryam in Surah Ali Imran. And he mentions it as well in the story of Yunus alayhi salam. So he mentions with regards to Zakariya when Maryam was born, her mother had vowed Maryam a servant uh, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Zakariya alayhi salam and the other uh, scholars had uh, all debated as to who should be her caretaker or who should sponsor her. And so they used their pens and some of the Mufassirin mentioned that they said, okay, throw his pen into the river or into a small stream or a creek and Whoever, whomever's pen will float uh, upstream, then this is the person who will get to uh, sponsor Maryam alayhi salam. And so all of them threw their pens into the stream, and Zakaria's pen was the one that uh, flew upstream or against the current. This is called casting lots. هذا الاستهام القرعة, right? It's also mentioned that Yunus alayhi salam. Uh, was on a ship, and uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَسَاهَمَ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْمُضْحَدِينَ that they drew lots, because as some of the scholars of tafsir mentioned, they were uh, in some bad waters, and they had to lose weight, and some people had to uh, be forsaken as well, and so they drew lots as to who should be, uh, basically take one for the team and go overboard. 
And so they all drew lots and it would constantly come up as Yunus alayhi salam. But they didn't want to throw Yunus overboard. Uh, they viewed him as being far too important. And so he jumped overboard because he realized that no matter how many times they did it, his would always come up. And so he understood it as something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regardless of how it took place, this is called a qur'a. This is not azlam, right? Another example is when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would travel, he would take one of his wives with him. Which one of his wives would he take? Well, they all have an equal right to go. And so he would draw lots, have his wives draw lots, and whoever, whoever uh, won in that drawing, then this is the one he would take with him, alayhi salatu was salam. This is for, as the scholars of fiqh mention, tamyiz al-huquq. This is a determining factor with regards to div dividing people's rights. Right? Uh, two people come to make adhan, or let's say in a masjid, where, uh, where there's no imam, let's say people are going to lead salah, who should lead in salah? The most versed in Qur'an, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. If they both know, the, the two candidates know the Qur'an equally, then the most versed amongst them in the sunnah. If they are both equal in that, then the one of them who made hijrah first. If they are equal in that, then the eldest. Let's say they are equal in all of that. Then we would cast lots. We would have them draw straws because they both have equal rights to that. This is called casting lots. This is drawing straws. This is something which is permissible. However, we do it. If you remember at our fundraising dinners uh, for the Mosque Foundation, we have a raffle, right? Like a giveaway. And so we have everyone's name in a bucket or in a something that'll mix them up. And then we choose random names. This is called Qur'a. This is permissible. This is actually prophetic. However, there is a difference between that and flipping a coin to make your decisions. This is part of superstition. This is something which is impermissible in Islam. How is that? The decision should be made in two ways. When I'm making a decision for myself, I need to make that decision and use two things. Number one, I need to use facts and knowledge to give the edge to one of the two options, or many options, right? Weigh the factors. And that has to do with فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That I am to ask those who are well-versed and knowledgeable in that field what I should do. Second of all, I am to make istikhara. Salat al-istikhara is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we were given in order to make our decisions. And it took the place of uh, al-azlam in the time of jahiliyyah. And so, if I am going to make a decision, you know, let's get which product am I going to buy? Or let's say, am I going to buy? Well, I try to look at things objectively first off. And so I do my research on both options, or however many options there are. And I consult people in that field so that I can get as much proper information on the subject as I can. After this, I will make Salat al-Istikhara. If I am still torn, I will make Salat al-Istikhara. And then I will go with one of the two. There is a, a kind of myth that's going around where if you make Salat al-Istikhara, you should wait to have a dream about it and do what the dream says. That is not correct. The, the, you know, there may come a dream associated with that issue. That may happen, but that is not a prerequisite. That's not necessarily the deciding factor of Istikhara. When a person makes a stikhara, he goes with what he feels is best if he made a stikhara properly, or she. And so, this 
is different than Al-Qur'ah. Al-Qur'ah is when everything is exactly equal between people. And now we draw lots in order to, or a raffle, or whatever. And I'll give an example of this. When we have, uh, let's say, you know, even though I, I don't like to use this as an example that much, but in football, American football, we have the coin toss at the beginning of the game to decide who's going to get the ball first, right? That coin toss, flipping the coin, that, it's the same action, flipping the coin to see which team gets the ball first, or flipping the coin to decide which product I'm going to buy. It's the same action, but in the case of the coin for the football teams, that is permissible, that is correct use of Al-Qur'an, and in the other case, this is uh, something which is haram and prohibited. Salat al-Istikhara takes the place of that. Walillahi alhamd. And so, these are things that I know people may think, well, what, you know, what's, what's the big issue about just flipping a coin? Or what's the big issue? We are not in a position to uh, make something big or small. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives things their uh, worth and their seriousness and their gravity, right? In the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some people spread some rumors about Aisha radiallahu anha. What were the ramifications of those rumors? We're still talking about them for 1,500 years. That's how serious these... It was about five people. That's how serious these five or seven or eight people, the rumors that they made, and a lot of these rumors weren't straight out, outright accusations. They were just kind of like question marks, you know? I saw this and I saw that. Wonder what's going on there. And yet, the ramifications are thus far 1,500 years later. And the ramifications were that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the issue and sent a messenger, sent uh, Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it became part of our, part of our Quran and tafsir and, right? So the ramifications were very serious. But when people were doing it at the time, they didn't think it was such a big deal. It's just a little rumor, Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in rebuttal to this mentality, He said, وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمًا You all do this, you say these things, all the while believing that they are not so serious, things that are to be taken lightly, yet with Allah and Allah's estimate, these things are very heinous and serious. So the gauge of this is petty and this is uh, worthy, this is of great gravity and this is of little significance, that doesn't come from us and what we immediately see here in front of us. This comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, this is uh, enough for this evening, inshallah. We will continue next week in the book of Al-Jumu'ah. Uh, we spoke very little about Zad al-Ma'ad tonight, but uh, these are very two important topics that uh, I felt to share with uh, the listeners. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.